Hello, everyone, and welcome to Flames Face Off, brought to you by the Hockey Writers. This is our weekly roundtable discussion where we talk everything Flames. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and share the show with your friends uh, and help us out. My name is Greg Tosowski, and I'll be filling in for Paul Quinney, who is off this week. And for those who watch the show faithfully and wonder if I golf this weekend, I did not. <laughs> I did yard work, and that's not the same. Um, now let's introduce the panel. First up, we have Colton Panku. Colton, how are you doing? I'm good, Greg. I, I did get to go golfing yesterday. Uh, my, just my second hey. round of the year. So yeah, yeah, I guess I went for you. Oh, well, at least someone golfed in this panel. And <laughs> below, below me on the screen or beside me, I'm not really sure, is Brett Krause. And Brett, um, this is the time of the show where Paul would usually make reference to your jersey. So I'm going to keep up the tradition and ask you a question. Which one of those behind you is the go-to if you had a Flames game tonight? And they allowed fans, and they were in the playoffs, which they're not. But uh, which one of those? Ooh, uh, well, I guess since I bought the Blasty one and haven't been able to go to a game since I bought it, it's uh, probably this this retro one. I think it's got a pocket dog and a couple of beer stains on it. So uh, yeah, that's the go-to. I I agree. I I go with that one as well. I have a, a retro amount of flames red, which is my go-to, and. Uh, I, I love that jersey. So, all right, enough enough jersey talk. Let's start the show. Uh, the week that was, the Flames finished up the regular season with their final two games of the, of the year against Vancouver, a 4-2 loss, and then a 6-2 drubbing of the Canucks. And the season's over, uh, 26, 27, and 3, and finished four points out of the final playoff spot. So what I want to talk about in these last two games, we saw some new additions. We finally saw the season debut of Louis third string Domingue and net. And we uh, finally saw uh, Matthew Phillips get his shot at an NHL game. And I want to ask you guys, we'll start with Brett. Uh, what were your impressions of the last two games with these newcomers? Uh, did any of these guys stand out for you? And uh, what were you, what's your take? Um, well, I think going, going back, kind of what you had been saying the last couple of weeks was to get Domingue into all four or at least three of those games. Cause he, he looked all right, but didn't have the best game, but he also hasn't played, I don't think, a game in over a year or something they had said on the broadcast. Um, so it's kind of really hard to tell, you know, get a guy back into an NHL game a year later. Um, and who knows, like he could have gotten a, a decent four-game performance out of him at some point, and uh, maybe you look at re-signing him, and who knows, maybe they do sign him as more depth this offseason, but... Um, yeah, I didn't really get a ton of, ton of oh, not as long a look as I would have liked. Um, and then Matthew Phillips, I think, you know, showed that there's a pot, there's still a chance there. I think he definitely gave uh, fans kind of what they were looking for. I, they, uh, that line of Ruzichka and Lucic played really well. And um, he almost buried one off a, a backland cross crease pass. And so I think. I think there's still something there, and I, I think fans are going to be clamoring again next season to put him into the lineup. How about you, Colton? What did you take from those final two games of the year and some of the newcomers that were in the lineup for the first time? Yeah, uh, kind of like we had said, I was kind of I, I was hoping it would happen a bit sooner, especially with Deming, like we had mentioned. I think to me that kind of tells me that they're not really considering him as a backup option for next year. I, I could be wrong, but. Uh, like Brett said, I thought Phillips looked pretty good. I was surprised, well, not surprised, but just couldn't get over how little he looks out there. But despite <laughs> that, I thought he still played, uh, played really well. And then Rizicka was able to get on the board too and put up his first assist. So, yeah, I thought uh, some promising signs that for two guys that I think uh, have a good shot at cracking the lineup next year. You know, I, I thought Phillips uh, was noticeable out there. Like he is a, he, he comes as advertised. He's got kind of this, um, he's really speedy out there and he seems to, um, you know, he has good vision on the ice and everything, but he does look small. Like he's, he's listed at 140, but they say he'd be closer to 150, but like 140, 150, what does that matter when like guys like Lou Cheech are like pushed probably 230 or 220. So I thought he looked good. And as for people talking about why was he there all four games, I did read an article yesterday saying that if he had played all four games and he like totally impressed, well, I think he's actually eligible to be selected at the expansion draft. And so like, if, if you showcase him too much, then, then maybe he's, you know, he's gone, maybe Seattle picks him up. So maybe not the worst thing that he didn't play all four games, but I was glad to see him get in and 
and uh, and show what he had, and which I thought he was he was pretty good. So as for Deming, you know, I thought he started off shaky, and then by the second third period, he looked like he was comfortable. But yeah, I would have liked to have seen him get a, a much better look than just the one game. But yeah, that could be very telling for what, for what the plan is for the for that backup spot next year. So. Um, Moving on to another topic of season ending discussions. Um, we've been talking at length about how this year has been disappointing for many of the Flames key players, guys like Matthew Kachuk. We've kind of been down on him and Sean Monaghan and, and even Markstrom had an up and down year. We've kind of been, you know, saying he hasn't been uh, the best uh, performer that we had hoped for. And, uh, but I want to talk about positive stuff now that, the season is over. Like who is a couple of guys, two or three guys that really stood out for you in a good way this year, this season. And uh, who, uh, oh, we'll, we'll start with Colton this time. Give me a couple of guys who you thought, you know, stood out in a positive way for the flames this year. Yeah. I think an obvious one is Chris Tanov. Um, when they signed him, I was kind of just this injury pass and everything. I was a bit hesitant, I guess. And he, was better than I think probably even management expected. He, I thought he was their best player this year. And then another guy I thought had a pretty impressive season was Noah Hannafin before he got hurt. And I think Tanev played a big part in that, being partnered with him for quite a while. But uh, yeah, I thought those two were quite good. How about you, Brett? Uh, give me, give me a few guys who are actually you know success stories for the Flames this year. Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> Andrew Montepone is the guy who. You know, I think is going to be very underrated in the league. I, I think among, you know, Flames uh, fans, they kind of know now what he's, you know, he really progressed this season. And um, I was reading a thing and he's his five on five goals. Like he's up there with like Anze Kopitar's and Sidney Crosby's and like guys of that, that ilk um, in terms of scoring at, you know, even strength. So I think, uh, and he led the led the team in even strength goals. So I think he's going to be a guy that, um, you know, really can drive offense next year. And uh, I think I'd like to give it to the, the first line as well uh, for their last part of the season with uh, Lindholm and uh, Kachuk and Goudreau because I think uh, Goudreau was on, you know, he had points in like 14 of his last 16 games and, Kachuk had a five or six game goal streak to end the season. And, you know, Lindholm was just quietly consistent uh, once again this, this year. So I think that's a, a line that going forward could uh, really help this team. If, if they, I would assume they continue to go with it. If big changes aren't made, that is. Yeah. I do have some stats here that would, uh, that kind of back up with some of the stuff you're saying, Brett, like, um, Andrew Mandrapani had the same amount of five on five goals as David Pasternak, Mark Stone, Braden Point, and Alex Ovechkin. Like he, he had hit 18 goals, which is a career high in a shortened season. And he was only one goal behind Goudreau and Lindholm for the team lead. Like, and, and because they were five on five goals, you know, this guy is, uh, he has uh, really shown this is kind of his, his breakout year. Like uh, he, and he, he also has a lot of, primary assists like this guy is a playmaker he's and he's been playing up and down the lineup he, he, he didn't have the, the same guys all year long he's been kind of playing with everybody so I can't say enough about Andrew Mangiapane season and I agree with with Colton about Tanev because uh he, he seemed to make whoever he played with better because they they were talking about Mark Giordano having a resurgence in this second half of the year well look what he was playing with they 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 paired him up with Tanev and so, so Tanev seems to be the uh the one that um, has straw the serve the drink when it comes to that top pairing. Um, and one other stat I have for you guys, you're talking about that top line and Goudreau, especially um, he had 22 points in 16 games. Once the Goudreau Linda home Kachuk line was put together and only two players in the NHL had more points than Goudreau in that span. And that was Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. So, so that goes to show you how, how well, Goudreau has played down the stretch here. So, and maybe we'll talk a bit about him a bit later in the show about the possibility of resigning him. But um, so, yeah, and, and that's, uh, I think those are the guys too that, that I would really pick who, who, who stood out this year. Like uh, um, I think guys like um, Lindholm, you know, he's consistent. He's consistently good, but you know, he's, he's not someone who's going to 
wow you every night. And guys like Backlund, you know, even Lou Cheech had a solid year, but uh, I would say Manjapani and definitely uh, uh, defenseman that we had talked about, uh, Hannafin and Tanev. All right, moving on, I have another question to put you guys on the spot. Um, the Flames tried to fill holes in their roster in the offseason with a bunch of one-year league minimum contracts. And I would say, based on what we've discussed all season long, it was not a success. Um, we've guys got, got like Levo, Nordstrom, Simone, Richie, and Stone. And of these five guys, um, have did any of them, in your mind, play themselves into a, a roster spot next year or deserve to be resigned to another one-year contract? Let's start with Brett. Wh which one of these guys might make the cut? Um, it's, it's funny. I, you know, I'm pretty sure I, I let out an actual groan when I had seen that they uh, signed Michael Stone, but um, he actually had an incredible season playing under Daryl Sutter and uh, kind of in that third pair role. So, I mean, he's big guy with a booming slap shot. So I, I kind of think he's a, he's a Sutter guy and, you know, he played well against the competition he had to face. And so I think that's a guy who maybe comes in as a, a six, seven for sure, maybe in and out of the lineup, but um, <clears throat> that's a guy that if, you know, he kind of has this career resurgence here that he could be a, a useful um, defenseman in the lineup uh, kind of on a, you know, here, here and there basis. And he's a, a right shot defenseman. So um, I think he could be, he may be one that um, is back and I kind of grew to like Brett Ritchie. He's kind of, he's, he can skate and, you know, he's physical and he, he kind of started to score at, uh, you know, kind of towards the end of the season. Um, I don't like Brett Ritchie on, you know, like top six Brett Ritchie, but um, I think he's a guy who could fill out that uh, fourth line because it's uh, we'll, we'll see kind of who gets taken in expansion and, uh, who who comes back, and I think he, he's a guy who could fill um, the fourth line spot for sure. How about you, Colton? Which one of these guys uh, we had talked about might get a, another look next season? Yeah, I, I had the same two in mind that Brett did. I think Stone uh, is a guy that's just a familiar face with the organization. Obviously, he's been there for a while now and um, has seemingly had no – issue well no or not anything publicly anyway about being held out of the lineup so I think that's an easy fit to bring back especially with how he has played this year and then I think Richie too he just adds some toughness and obviously it, it seems like the coaching staff likes him like Brett had alluded to they've given him time in the top six and then hopefully that's not the case going forward but I, I do think he's a guy that they'd look to bring back you know I think you're right about Stone I think he's basically pushed out Nesteroff who was, who, who's kind of brought in, you know, this year to kind of fill in that, that uh, third pairing role. And well, Nesterov hasn't been really bad, but he hasn't been great, I don't think. And he's just kind of in and, out, in and out over the lineup. So I would say that Nesterov is not coming back. And Stone, yeah, like he was, uh, I'm surprised his history is kind of crazy with the Flames, how he's been bought out and re-signed and all, all this stuff. And one thing that I'm, I'm impressed with, he's a heavy shot. This guy from the point, you know, he, he unloads. It's a it's a good hard shot. In that. And so I was actually kind of with Brett, I was kind of like, Oh, why are they putting stone in like, geez, but he actually played really well. And I think he deserves a second look and Richie too. I would, I would be on, on board with that, but I have one more for you. And um, uh, Josh Levo he was, was kind of a bit of a bust, especially the first half of the year. Cause they couldn't seem to find a spot, but once um, Sutter came to town, Levo scored all six of his goals under Sutter. Now I'm not sure if that, says something that maybe he's responding to Sutter's system or he likes Sutter or the fact that maybe it takes a longer than you think to recover from a broken kneecap, which is what he had, which, which he suffered with the Vancouver Canucks uh, last season. So, um, so, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they gave Levo another look just because he seemed to have a, a better second half. And then he had to be, be off for a couple of weeks because he had COVID. So his season was kind of like a weird one overall. So, so maybe, you know, I would, I would say, yes, yeah, Stone might get a look. Richie, I think, deserves, you know, his, his another look. And uh, maybe we both. So anyways, um, but I think we can all agree that the Nesterov experiment wasn't uh, anything that should be revisited. Am I? Am I yeah, I think that? it was just okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
Okay, um, and Thursday, moving on, was clean out your locker day uh, when, when the t- NHL teams that don't make the playoffs kind of face the media and um, a little different this year. As, instead of people in the locker room, it was all kind of virtual as, as it's been all season long. But there were some things that kind of surprised me and um, we can talk about what we learned and how you guys, uh, what you think of some of the stuff that was said. Um, to kind of recap, uh, Daryl Sutter said something which, I thought was pretty telling and pretty honest. I'm not surprised he would say something like this, but he said, I think there was a big miscalculation on who put expectations on this team, which kind of says, tells me that he doesn't think that this was as good as a team as people were making out at the start of the season when people were picking the flames to finish second, third or fourth in the division. And then Brad Living kind of seemed to contradict Sutter by kind of coming out and telling the media that he thought this was not a bad team, you know, that, that that didn't play up to capabilities. I think it was a team that didn't play to its capabilities. Therefore it fell short. Like he was very diplomatic about it. He kind of contradicted that. And which one of these guys is right? Like uh, I'm, I'm kind of siding with, um, with Sutter because he's, he seems to be the only kind of honest voice in the room these days. And he kind of tells it like it is. What do you guys think of these contrasting takes on the, on the season from the GM and the coach. Um, uh, let's start uh, with Colton. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I I think it's kind of the thing that we've been talking about all year, right? Are they just inconsistent, or is this kind of what they are? I think uh, I'm still kind of more with Tree Living in that I I still think they're a bit of a better team than they had showed this year. I I mean, I think some of the um, early season predictions of them kind of being first, second place, whatever it may be in the division was a little miscalculated, but I, I do think they're a better team than they performed this year. I think they're better than Montreal. And I, I do think that they should have probably made it into the playoffs. Brett, which one of these guys is, uh, are you leaning towards on how the season went here? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Cause I, I kind of side with both guys here. I think, you know, from a head coach perspective, you kind of see what's happening on the ice and the, the, the GM perspective, you, you don't want to come out and say that this roster you built in the off season is not good enough. Um, but yeah, I think they're kind of both right. I think I might lean more with Daryl Sutter um, just because he, you know, gets what he gets on the ice and sees what he gets on the ice. And I, I think this team is like, they're almost there, but just not quite. And, you know, kind of the disappearance of, Sean Monahan, although it's, you know, kind of rumored he may have been injured all season. Um, you know, that hurt. Um, I think a slow start for a guy like Josh Levo, you're saying, who, you know, I think can be a good two-way player and he you know, could really help this team out defensively. I think, you know, there's a, a guy who could have, you know, had he started off, you know, on the right foot, probably helps. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's still some holes in the, the roster. Uh, I think they definitely could have pushed for a playoff spot. Um, the Markstrom injury didn't help, and he didn't really kind of get his legs back after that great start. So I'm like, you know, they talk about all this change maybe coming this season, and I'm kind of thinking maybe they should, you know, just try and not serve what they did last season with all these depth signings, but you know, try and get a, a medium sized fish, if you will, to who can kind of help in the, the middle six somewhere. And I think that could really, you know, boost this, the team. And, um, but yeah, I think they just, I think Daryl Sutter was a little more correct. I think this team isn't quite as good as a lot of people predicted, because I think a lot of people even said that they could have won this division. Um, well, one thing that True Living said, he actually was on the Sportsnet 960 afternoon show talking to the guys there and he said something which he hasn't really said in the past years which kind of struck me as well he said our team has got to change and determining what those changes are is what we will have to figure out and um, he also went on to say which I was kind of surprised that he said for the first time since he arrived in Calgary they really have to look at the core because if the core you know hasn't won you know he's, he's been dealing with the same guys almost his entire seven-year tenure so some of these core guys. So I was a bit surprised to hear him say that because he's, he's kind of been more, you know, on, on, on board with kind of this team needs tinkering as opposed to this team needs an overhaul. And I really don't know how much he can accomplish this off season, but um, 
Johnny Goudreau seems to be like a lightning rod of uh, controversy or, or topics of discussion because he's he, he actually came out in the in that media availability and told them that he would like to stay in Calgary. He says, I've never said that I didn't want to be here. And he kind of said, I want Tree to kind of, we'll, we'll negotiate this summer. And do you think uh, based on, you know, Goudreau's kind of like, it was pretty heartfelt. And I think a, a lot of people are maybe buying it and he's right. He's never said he didn't want to be here. It's always been rumors from Eric Francis or some other hockey pundits who were saying, Oh, he wants back East. He's, he's, he played in Boston college. He's from, you know, the East Coast, he wants to, he wants to head back. So based on what Trey Living has said about uh, talking about the core and based on what Good Guru told the media, what do we expect? What do we expect to see, Brett? Uh, what do you think is going to happen with, with Good Row based on the, the stuff that was heard on Thursday? Um, yeah, I, that was a big, I think, boost of confidence to a lot of fans. I think we probably will see a Goudreau extension. I think that, like, listening to that press conference, he, you know, sounded incredibly sincere about it and he meant it. You know, you, you look over out east in Buffalo and you listen to Jack Eichel press conferences and you go, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a guy who's just sort of saying what he needs to say. Um, but you, you listen to that Johnny Goudreau interview and, you know, he sounds pretty sincere and he kind of, yeah, I, th I think he said something about, you know, kind of what his family is planning for and, and stuff like this. And he's enjoyed his seven, six, seven years here in Calgary. And so I think that's, you know, I think a truthful comment. And I think if, if this team, you know, wants to be successful, I think they're going to need the next couple more seasons or three or four of Johnny Goudreau while he's still at his, his prime. And um, cause I, I was looking up his stats and I think he had more, more points by game 500 than Jerome McGilla did. So, I mean, two totally different players, but um, you know, I think he's, he's the best, uh, player Calgary has seen since Jerome McGinley. And so I think, yeah, they, they I'm on team resign Goudreau. And, you know, I think that, uh, kind of those, those rumors that have been swirling have just kind of come from one source in Calgary media. <laughs> Colton, what do you think, uh, was Johnny hockey sincere in the, his press avail availability there on Thursday? Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of these rumors too, I was reading an article in 2017, I think it was, and Goudreau was saying something about, uh, he got asked about the possibility of playing back home, closer to home. I think the question was the Flyers, and he was saying if the opportunity ever came up, like it would be cool just having friends around there and everything. And I think that kind of got twisted as him saying that it was going to happen or something he wanted to. I think he was more just saying that it would be a neat opportunity. And I think some... Calgary media has kind of run with that and said that he is planning to leave and all that. But no, I, I think his comments were sincere. Like you guys were saying, I think uh, it sounds like he does want to stay. And I mean, last year, I, I kind of thought it was inevitable that he was gone. I think obviously, like you had said, Eric Francis had kind of started the whole thing that seemed like he wanted to run him out. And then, uh, yeah, I kind of thought last off season maybe, but I've changed on that. And I, I do think an extension will get done. You know, another thing to consider is, um, we had talked earlier in the show about this new top line with Lindholm and Kachuk and Goudreau and how Goudreau has been very effective on that line. And all of those guys have, you know, even Kachuk had a bit of a surge at the end of the season playing with this line. And so splitting them up from Monaghan seems to be, you know, a successful experiment here. And does, does that make Monaghan expendable? You know, like uh, it was always a, the Johnny and Monty show, but if, if this year didn't work out, I know that Monaghan was, uh, was injured, but uh, does, does this make uh, sense that, that perhaps Sean Monaghan is on the block and maybe is, he's on, on his way out? Uh, let's start with Colton. What do you think? Yeah, I think we kind of touched on it last week too. And yeah, I think uh, if there is a big name to get moved out of Calgary this offseason, I think he'd be the number one guy. Just two disappointing seasons in a row. And I know he was, it sounds like Brett had said earlier, he was hurt this year. But I just think maybe a change of scenery for him and he could kind of get back to the guy he was in Calgary a few years ago. And I think it might just work out best for both sides. Brett, what do you think? Is, uh, is Monaghan long for this world when it comes to staying in Calgary? Yeah, I think, you know, looking at with him being injured 
has me thinking they might not um, do something, but I think he's definitely the number one guy right now to be shipped out other than whoever gets taken by Seattle here. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, yeah, I mean, they split up Goudreau and Monaghan and you know, that line, you know, just was so good to end the season. Um, so it'll be interesting. I, I mean, maybe Monaghan is used to sort of do that shake up of the core and but at the same time you know we're you know three guys sitting here saying he's had two disappointing seasons so uh, probably 30 other nhl franchises also know that so um, you just kind of wonder what if he's the guy to shake up the core what what are you really changing or or getting back sort of in that deal i think he could be right there so well, let's move on to another topic. It's, this is a little different because uh, it's not necessarily Flames hockey, but there are Flames players. The, the World Hockey Championships is going on right now in Riga, Latvia. It was canceled last year. It's on this year. And it's kind of a tournament of no stars. Like uh, there's, only, there's only, I think, three players on Team Canada who have played in this tournament before. And I think up looking at the rosters of the other countries, it's really um, not a lot of big names. And so, but... From the Calgary Flames, we've got Andrew Mangiapane, who is in in in, in there in in the other championships, but he's still quarantining, so he hasn't played yet. And we have Connor Mackey for Team USA, Nesterov for Russia, Emilio Pedersen for Norway, Flames prospect, and another prospect, Ilya Solyov. Am I saying that right? Solovyov, playing mm-hmm. for Belarus. And um, I'm just wondering. In past years, I think this has been a very important, you know, tool for some players to get experience playing best on best. And but does the fact that it's this weird year where there's no stars, you know, diminish this chance for Manjapani and others, or does it is this actually a good opportunity to, to get some like to like lead a team that uh, in an in international tournament? Uh, let's start with Brett. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it'll it'll still be good. I, you know, it's not star studded affair here, but um, I still think it's good to, you know, you go out against international competition and like Manjapane has never played for a team Canada at any level. Um, so I think this will be a huge boost for him. You know, he, he did get recognized by, uh, you know, team Canada's management group. And so, you know, he's kind of making a name for himself and, uh, I'm kind of interested to watch uh, the two of the flames prospects and, and Connor Mackey as well. Um, Cause I think he may, I haven't seen USA's roster, but he might get a um, sort of higher spot on the defense pairs. But uh, I'm interested to see uh, Emilio Peterson because he had a fairly good year with Stockton and he's got some skill. So it um, be interesting to see how uh, he fares. And this Ilya Solovyov, uh, I think he was an overager when they drafted him. But he went and play, was playing like 15 to 20 minutes a night in the KHL this past season. And um, from what I can tell, he, he did all right. I think he had, you know, uh, single-digit points, but he was still playing fairly regularly. So, you know, maybe that's a, a guy that they uh, sort of see something in, in the next few years. But um, I think overall this World Championship will be interesting because we've already seen – Latvia beat Canada, and I think uh, Kazakhstan just beat Finland this morning in a shootout. Uh, so, so I think with less star players, it kind of evens the playing field a bit. So it might make it a little interesting. Colton, what are you looking for at this World Championships for the for the Flames guys who are competing overseas? Yeah, well, I think it's just good for all those guys that get to go. Because obviously with this season just being cut short and everything, it just they didn't get as much games in as they normally would. So I think just being able to play more certainly can't hurt for next year. And then, like you kind of touched on with Manji Apani, I think uh, the fact that it's not so much of a star-studded tournament, uh, he will get the chance to – I think he kind of will be one of the more go-to guys for Canada, which obviously, like Brett had said, he's never really had that opportunity before. So I think it can't hurt, and we'll just give him more confidence going into next season. Yeah, it's funny because I, I, I taped the first game and I started watching it and I was like, well, where's Manjapani? Then I went on Twitter and they said, oh, he's still quarantining. And then the game game two that Canada has against USA is happening right as we speak, as we're, as we're recording this. And Team Canada is down 4 nothing to Team oh. USA right now. And Manjapani is still, according to the internet, not in that, in that lineup. So he's still quarantining. So I hope he gets in there 
before they run out of games because if Canada doesn't start winning some games, they're not going to be playing, you know, in, in the playoffs of this thing. So, and the man Japan is going to go a long way for just to play a couple of games. But I agree that I'm looking forward to seeing how he, you know, based on this lineup, he would be one of the better players, better forwards in this group. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how he can fare in this. And I feel bad for Dylan Dubé. He was slated to go and he, he got a concussion in that final game, which, which also might make some people kind of wonder why they had, you know, all these roster players playing down the stretch and maybe they could have had more prospects and more AHL guys playing, but that's a discussion for another time. But in any event, um, I think that's all the time we have for this week. Um, thanks for watching everybody. Uh, make sure to check out all of the great content we have at the hockey and uh, be sure to join us uh, next time on Flames Face Off. So have a great week, everybody.